Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Auckland, Paul Felder versus Dan Hooker. And Shaq, it's going down this Saturday in Auckland, New Zealand. Paul the Irish Dragon Felder taking on the Kiwi, Dan the Hangman Hooker in the main event. Yeah, this is a great main event, uh, a fight that I saw you know, happening after both these guys' last fights. And I'm super excited. Paul Felder, it seems like he's finally been getting over some mental hurdle, mental hurdles in his career. And Hooker, you know, these last two fights, he's been looking really good as well. Ever since he moved up to 55s, seems like his career has changed for the better. So I'm excited. Man, it's so good to see both these guys finally get the consistency that they need to truly make a run. Because I know you remember Hooker back at Featherweight, win one, lose one. With Felder, you were always wondering, when's this guy going to pull the trigger? Well, now they're both top 10 fighters in the most stacked division in the entire sport, Shaq. And uh, here they got a main event slot, and uh, the winner of this fight is going to move on to the top five. Yeah, 100%. I mean, if you win main event fights, then you go places. So I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait as well, man. And this is a great car start to finish. Obviously, it's been getting a lot of heat because it's some lower, you know, some smaller names. But, man, I'm excited about it. In the co-main event, you got two prospects, Jimmy the Brute Crew taking on Lord Michal, Oleg Sechuk. Also, you got a crossroads fight between Yan Zonan and the former number one contender, Karolina Kovalkovic. So I feel like uh, they put their best foot forward here in Auckland, and uh, the night's going to deliver, my man. Yeah, I mean, this card's stacked from top to bottom. Like you said, Yan Zonan, always excited when she fights, fighting Carolina, a former title challenger, Krutinola Chechuk. My boy Kevin Aguilar is making his return against Zuba, so I'm excited, man. Yeah, I am too, man. And uh, Shaq, let's get right down to business. Because first up in the flyweight division, we got a matchup between Shanna Dobson, she's 3-3, three and three, and Priscilla Pedrita Cachoeira is 8-3. and three. Currently, they got Shanna Dobson minus 220, and the comeback on Priscilla Cachoeira is plus 180. Well, Shaq, they're giving both of these ladies one last chance to get a win and hopefully uh, stay uh, with the company. Who do you think is going to get it done, man? You think it's going to be the brawling style of Cachoeira, or you think Shanna Dobson is going to get another one? Yeah, I mean, we definitely know that this is a low-level women's MMA fight, and, you know... Uh Look, both these girls aren't very good. You got Shayna Dobson. I mean, my God. I mean, you know, I think she was, you know, 15 or 16 seed on tough. Uh, you know, she lost to Lauren Mueller. Uh, and then her fight against Sabina Mazo. I mean, that fight was over seconds in. So, I mean, Shayna Dobson, bottom of the barrel. I mean, that's for facts. Uh, Cachoeira just has a very, she gets hit a ton. You know, she calls herself the zombie or a zombie girl. But, uh, you know, zombie girls all fun and games until, you know, I mean, look, you got to stop taking punches to the face. I mean, she does put on good pressure. And I do think she's fought better opponents. You know, Valentina Shevchenko, Molly McCann, and, uh, and Luana Carolina. I mean, all those girls have winning records. So, uh, as were Shayna Dobson. Man, you know, I just don't think she should ever be lying this high in a fight from a betting perspective. I mean, look, Cachoeira is somewhat of a punching bag, but I think she's tougher. I think she's going to move forward. I feel like this maybe could be a spot where uh, <laughs> that pressure and that forward game pan finally ends up uh, working out for her just because I, I do have a feeling that Shayna Dobson just, quite honestly, just isn't built mentally for the UFC. I mean, she just seems like, uh, you know, she does this for fun. Um you know, she does have some clean punches, definitely cleaner boxing than Cachoeira, but I question, you know, her on the inside. You know, I, I just get a vibe. Uh, she doesn't really belong here. I think Cachoeira is tough enough to, to be in this company, so I think I think she'll get her first UFC one. Look, Shanna Dobson's only 3-3, three and three, man. She's got no business in the big show at this point in her career. She needs to go back to the regionals, get some experience, and then hopefully uh, get a call back because, I mean, if we're being honest, she's actually 3-4 and because she got stopped in the first round on the Ultimate Fighter against Roxanne Modafferi. One takedown, the fight was over shortly after Shaq. And with Priscilla Cachoeira, talk about uh, getting fed to the wolves in your UFC debut. And, you know, you're not out here fighting... Uh, you know, Rachel Ostovich in your debut. Uh, how about we throw you in there with Valentina Shevchenko, your first fight inside the company? And, man, uh, look, she took that ass whooping. Uh, 
Like, I, you know, we say she took the ass whooping like a man, but, you know, she she took it and didn't quit, man. So I got to give her a lot of respect. It was a devastating beating. The subsequent fight against Molly McCann. Look, she went out there and won a round against Molly McCann on all three judges' scorecards. That's something that Shayna Dobson would never do. And then the, the next fight with Luana Carolina, I also feel like that was somewhat higher level than the fights I've been seeing Shanna Dobson in. Look, Shanna definitely has cleaner technique like you mentioned in in the stand-up but it seems like in this weight class power counts for a lot because not all these girls can pack a big punch and priscilla cachoeira goes forward the entire time and if she's not getting picked apart i think she's gonna land the bigger shots here maybe even mixing a takedown or two so i'm gonna go with the more experienced priscilla cachoeira to come out here and get her first ufc win now, next up in the welterweight division, we got a matchup between Maki Coconut Bombs Pitolo, he's 12 and 5, and Takashi Sato is 15 and 3. Currently, they got Maki Pitolo, he's a plus 120 dog, and Takashi Sato is a minus 140 favorite. Well, Shaq, it was a pick 'em. Now the action's starting to come in on Takashi Sato. You agree with uh, the line movement, or what, what are you thinking about this matchup here? Maki Pitolo let a lot of people down in his debut against uh, Callan Potter. A lot of people thought he was going to come in and get the quick knockout just because off, off his contender series performance. But me and you both know the guy that he fought on contender series is a complete joke. So so, uh, you know, Mikey Patolo is a guy that's been knocked out unconscious. He's pulled several stunts, you know, throughout his career uh, back in that Victory FC promotion. I mean, just go back and watch. Uh, I forget the guy's name. But Cassius Kane. Yeah, Cassius Kane. But, uh, Even the Dakota uh, Cocker yeah, fight. I mean, he, he's, he's pulled some, I mean, fights where he's been dominating and then all of a sudden, you know, he's knocked out stiff. So, Mikey Patolo is a hard guy to trust. In this case, he is the dog. And now he's going up against Sato, who is somewhat, I don't want to say equally chinny, but I mean he's definitely been wobbled several times throughout his career and that's even when he's fought jobber you know jobbers out there in Pancras I mean he was still getting rocked now I do feel like Sato you know does have a better understanding of distance and range and I do think he's a more competent striker than Mikey Batolo who you know he calls himself coconut bombs but from what I see man the dude just stands there in the pocket like an idiot trying to you know throw pitter patter and try to get off on these like four or five punch combos and he doesn't move his head so if Maki Patolo is able to crack Sato and not uh, and, and you know hurt him and knock him out, but Maki just seems like he kind of loses his mind in there. I do feel like he might be willing to engage more than Sato. I do feel like he quote unquote doesn't give a fuck, you know, uh, as where Sato doesn't really like to engage in that pocket type brawl because he knows he doesn't have the chin, but. I, I got to lean Sato. I think he fights with more sense. I think he is the better overall fighter. But from a betting perspective, it's hard to back either of these guys. You got Sato, who only throws lefts, and his volume's really low. But then you got Patolo, whose volume's high, but his defense is lacking. So uh, I'm going to sit back and watch it. Yeah, it's an interesting fight, man. It's almost like a brawler in Mackie Patolo versus a karate guy in Takashi Sato. When the fight was first announced, I was like, oh, man, Takashi Sato is going to counter this guy, you know, trying to run in with something reckless. But then when I watched the tape, and that might still happen, but when, when, I, when I sat back and watched some video on this, man, Takashi Sato gets rocked every single fight, Shaq. And we're not just talking about against, you know, top 20 opponents like Bilal Muhammad. What about the Ben Saunders fight? What about his fight right before the UFC debut? What about the Glaco Franza fight? So Takashi Sato has a history of going in there, and he doesn't like it when you hit him on the chin. And same thing can be said with Mackie Patolo because he's a guy, he beat Cassius Kane For some reason, look, you beat the guy, then you, then you offer him a rematch, and he gets knocked out in a way in that rematch where – you would have thought, man, this guy will never come back the same, but he got his contender series call, impressed the boss enough to give him a contract. And in that UFC debut against Callan Potter, I mean, I know it might have been a little sloppy, a little this, a little that, but man, that was a hell of a fight. Super entertaining. And if Mackie Patolo can just make a couple adjustments, I think he can come out here, close the distance, make that octagon feel small, and touch the chin of Takashi Sato. He's just got to be very careful here because Takashi's looking to snipe, man. Takashi's looking to counter with a nice straight left, a high kick, something among those lines when Mackey tries to come in with, uh, with the quote-unquote coconut bombs, the coconut feathers, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I I'm going to go with Mackey Patolo here. I think he's the tougher guy. Now, next up in the strawweight division, we got a matchup between Angela Hill, she's 11-7, and, and Loma Lukbunmi is 4-1. and one. 
Currently, they got Angela Hill minus 175, and the comeback on Loma Luke Boonmi is plus 155. Well, Shaq, uh, it's kind of cool to see Angela Hill taking all these fights on short notice. She's definitely gained a lot of respect from the MMA community. And in a sense, this is a very favorable matchup because Loma Luke Boonmi is going to give Angela Hill the kind of fight she wants, a nice stand-up fight. You think Angela Hill is going to go out here and prove that she's a better striker than the former Muay Thai world champion, or do you think she's going to take the safe route and try to get this to the mat? I think this is uh, one of the more underrated fights on the card. Hill's been looking good. Her last two fights, she finished... Uh, uh, Corner Lassi and Hannah Cyphers and you know I feel like now that she's taken uh, this step down in competition you know away from the Marcos and the and the Yan Zhao Nans and the Courtney Casey's and the, you know those level of Androvs and those level of opponents that she's having success so I wouldn't necessarily say that Hill is this new fighter like everyone like the like the new uh, the new take on her is I mean I do feel like she's getting a little bit more comfortable she is fighting frequently I still don't view her as like uh, in the title picture or anything but now she's fighting another only five fights professionally uh Luma, I, I, I wouldn't even say green i would just say she she's lacking in the cage time you know i feel like for a fudge a girl with five fights i mean she impressed me man i i feel like a lot of girls aren't competent in that muay thai game obviously hill is but uh i feel like luma's a, a lot better than people think you know i feel like yeah she is coming up from animate all those things are true but she's got a very disciplined muay thai game kind of reminds me of a jermaine duranamy type style you know where she kind of backs herself into the fence because she's very comfortable stuffing against with her uh, back on the fence that explosion with the right hand uh i respect her muay thai hill i feel like you know the cyphers fight was good and all, but I consider Loma with a, a lot more potential than that. So I, obviously, I favor Hill. She should be the favorite. The favorite, but I'm still a little sketchy about you know laying minus two on her. You know, and I feel like this is could could possibly be. A, a lot tougher of a fight than people think i know the hype's on hill right now you know she's on rogan's podcast this and that and you know she's doing her thing so i, I will pick her to get a win but i would not be shocked if this fight was 1-1 going into the third round and that if this fight was up for grabs i think a lot of people are sleeping on luma's talent yeah, look, Loma is definitely very talented, like you mentioned. Her technique is on point, but man, I simply think she's too small for this weight class. I know Adam weight to straw weight, it's only a 10 pound difference, but those 10 pounds count for a lot, man. And you saw in that fight against Albu, which was her first fight in the straw weight division, even though she clearly won. I didn't like the fact that Albu was walking her down like that. And, and I know the comparison to Jermaine Durandamy. The thing is, she doesn't have that size like Jermaine Durandamy or the takedown defense. And while Angela Hill isn't exactly known for taking other ladies down, man, she hit a very nice boot sweep on Hannah Cyphers, that last one. And when she got on top of her, the fight was over shortly after. I saw Albu go out there and hit a scissor takedown on Loma in that fight. And I also saw Loma get submitted in 2018. I, I think that as long as Angela Hill didn't underestimate her to a point, because I mean, look, she was doing Rogan earlier this, you know, to do Rogan, you got to be in California in person. And then she made the flight to New Zealand, which is like a goddamn 24 hour flight. It takes a couple days to acclimatize. As long as all that stuff isn't a factor, she's not sick, you know, things like that. I think she's going to come out here and just outclass Loma just on, on the merit that she's much more experienced in MMA. And, and she's a bigger woman, too. So I'm going to go with Angela Hill here, but I'd like to see, you know, what kind of state she's in after, you know, the short notice to fly, all those things. Now, next up in the flyweight division, we got a matchup between Kai Kara France. He's 20 and 8, and Tyson Nam is 18 and 10. Currently, they got. Kai Kara France minus 260 in the comeback on Tyson Nam is plus 220. Well, Shaq, it's interesting, man, because uh, for those that don't know, Tyson Nam has a knockout win over Eduardo Dantas. Tyson Nam has a knockout win over Ali Bagautinov. Finally got the call to the UFC. A lot of people said it was 10 years too late, but here he is, man. You think he's going to get uh, that signature UFC win here over Kai Kara France in New Zealand? Yeah, it's a good fight. I do feel like the UFC got Tyson Nam a little bit too late. It's unfortunate what happened with that uh, with that contract situation with World Series, you know, back in the day. But then he went on that four fight skid. It kind of he, he kind of fell off, but he kind of reemerged. Uh, Tyson Nam is I don't want to say he's a jobber, but you know, because he's got a great he's like a better Sukumtut. Yeah, you know, he's just a flute KO type of guy. I mean, if it goes to decision, he's definitely losing. <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, 
you know, I respect his skills. I respect his power. But all he throws his hands. He doesn't really throw much kicks. Kai Kara France is also a little bit of the same. Kai Kara ducks his head down for every, uh, you know, before he attacks for everything. And we saw Moreno uh, start, you know, throwing those knees up the middle. And, I mean, Moreno broken, but Tyson M's nowhere near on that level. I mean, look, Tyson M definitely has a puncher's chance, but I see Kai Kara landing the harder shots with that big right hand. I mean, this guy went toe-to-toe with Halion Paiva. I respect him for that. Uh, he put on a good performance against De La Rosa as well. I think he's going to come in here and, you know, have a nice little breeze uh, 30-27. He's definitely got to watch that one-shot KO because Tyson uh, has left people in the speechless, you know, before. I mean, he, he will have a food KO here and there, so. But I'll go with Kai Car France by dominant decision. Man, that Tyson Nam fight against Ali Baga Utina, the guy got dominated for 14 minutes and 59 seconds. All Ali Baga Utina's got to do is run away and put his hands up in the air. Instead, he decides to engage in the pocket, gets slept with one second left in the fight shack. So Tyson Nam carries that power for all 15 minutes and. That's literally the only thing Kai Kara France has to avoid. I'd be shocked if Tyson Nam comes out here and submits Kai Kara France or wins a decision. His only path to victory in my mind is that one punch knockout. And guess who also hits hard, man? Kai Kara France has a nice right hand too, but Kai Kara France can go out there, win that long game, win the decision. And I think that's exactly what he's going to do, man. Look, Tyson Nam's a very durable guy, a very tough guy. I think he'll hang in there. But I simply think Kai Car France's output and just his ringmanship and his octagon experience are going to carry him to a unanimous decision victory here. Now, next up in the welterweight division, we got a matchup between Callan the Rockstar Potter. He's 18 and 8, and Keenan Song is 15 and 5. Currently, they got. Keenan Song, minus 200. The comeback on Callan Potter is plus 170. It's an interesting matchup, man, because when you look at it, obviously Keenan Song's got all the physical tools. You know, if you, if you look at a picture of both these guys, you're like, oh, man, Keenan Song's going to mop the floor with this guy. And he might. He might knock him out. He's got a very nice counter right hand. But when you actually watch it, I mean, Callan Potter is the much tougher guy. He's got the better ground game here. And uh, if he can avoid going down to that one shot, I do think that his grit is going to carry him to a victory here because, once again, you know, he might have the dad bod. It might look kind of, you know, not the prettiest, but he kind of reminds me of like a welterweight Dan Kelly. You know, you remember Dan Kelly walking into the octagon with his knees bandaged up and then made uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. make uh, lady sounds inside the octagon, then went on to beat the former, uh, or excuse me, went on to beat the UFC Hall of Famer, Rashad Evans as well. So these guys can have success from that camp. And Callan Potter, you saw in his last fight against Mackie Patolo, who's got a lot of knockouts on his resume. I really felt like that cut to 55 affected Potter in a bad way. You know, you saw that fight against Jalen Turner. First shot that lands puts him down. But then against Mackie Patolo, the guy ate like 100 strikes and stayed standing the whole time. So I truly believe that weight class, excuse me, that weight cut diminished his chin a bit. And at 170, you know, even though the guy is not going to be a title challenger or anything like that, this this will be the best version of him we've ever seen. So as far as Keenan Song, like I mentioned, he's got all the athletic tools. He's got a very nice right hand. But, man, I question uh, what happens when the fights get heated, man. You saw that Alex Morano fight. Alex Morano has significantly, you know, not as good technique as Keenan Song and was still teeing off on him. Even in those two fights that he won, or especially the Hector Aldana one, Hector was putting it on him. But, man, he found the home for that right hand. And even in the Derek Krantz fight, when Derek Krantz took him down, he couldn't get back up. So I'm not convinced that if, if Callan Potter takes him down, that he gets back up either. So simply put, I think this this fight should be closer than it's lined. And if Callan Potter doesn't go down to a nice right hand, I think he's going to grind out Keenan Song by simply being tougher than him, Shaq. You got Callan Potter? Yes, sir. Yeah, so Keenan Song, you know, he's he likes to sit back. He likes to counter with the right hand. Uh, in a lot of his fights, and I do think he's somewhat a, a bit of a slow starter. Uh, Callum Potter seems like a tough guy. He moves forward, takes a lot of damage. You know, uh, personally, I, I think his win over Mackie was good, but I also think that there's a good chance that Mackie Patolo doesn't belong in this company. I mean, Mackie Patolo was standing in that pocket, like I said, literally pitter-pattering five punches, and Callum Potter got rocked several times in that fight. And this guy, you know, he is a black belt, uh, but... 
I've seen him lose position multiple times in that Maki Patolo fight, almost get choked out in that Maki Patolo fight. So I think that he's still very sloppy. I think he's still a punching bag. I still think that he's very chinny. So uh, just in terms of a health perspective, I know he's coming off a win, but Maki Patolo, guys, this guy is a stunt puller. I wouldn't <laughs> rate that win, you know, so high. Keenan Song, I think he, you know, beats the guys that he's supposed to beat and he loses to the guys that he, he's supposed to lose to. Yeah. He'll struggle a little bit with these, uh, the Derek Krantz's of the world and the um, Alex Morano's and the Alex Morano's of the world and things like that. So we obviously know that he's also a middle of the pack fighter. But I think on the given day, Callan Potter can uh, go to a bottom of the barrel fighter. I think that. He takes too many, too much damage. I think the right hand can be there for Keenan Song all night. I don't think Callum Potter moves his head. If Keenan Song wants to move forward and, and try to wrestle, I've seen the guy lose position many times. I, I still think that Keenan Song is good enough to beat this guy. Obviously, we're going to find out. I respect Callum Potter's toughness, but I think he takes too many punches, and I don't think he'll be able to consistently take Keenan's right hand. So I'll take Keenan Song by knockout in the second round. Now, next up in the welterweight division, we got a matchup between Jake Matthews. He's fifteen and four, and Emil Meek is nine and four. Currently, they got Jake Matthews minus two hundred, and the comeback on Emil Meek is plus one seventy. Well, Shaq, we've seen Jake Matthews in the UFC since he was nineteen years old. Now he's only twenty five, so he's still not even fully in his prime yet. But I feel like this version of him at welterweight we've seen is the best one yet. And with Emil Meek, I mean, talk about his back being up against the wall. If he doesn't get this win, uh, goodbye, Emil Meek. So you know this guy is motivated and focused. Uh, you think he's going to come out here and get this upset? Emil Meek is a guy who I feel like was a uh, uh, s somewhat of a hype job slash uh, overachiever. You know, he came in off that win against Pajares, you know, with a lot of hype. He knocked Tusamar out, then he beat Jordan Mean. And Jordan Mean was coming out of retirement. He uh, kind of one foot in, one foot out. And it's definitely a good name on his uh, – resume but then kind of transpired after you know he took the fight with Usman now if I'm his manager you know I get it you want a shot at Usman and for whatever reason you know Usman didn't really have anyone to fight at the time but I feel like you know Mick uh comes off as a very confident uh brash guy but I feel like he is a little uh deterred or weathered in a, in a state you know I, uh, in a sense you know I feel like the Usman fight kind of did take some out of it because then we saw him everyone thought that Bart the Bartos Fabinski fight you know Fabinski's got no stand-up all he's gonna do is is come in and wrestle and you know what does Mick do he tries to pull a Masvidal five second uh, KO and and gets taken down uh, immediately but you know I do think Meek's a tough guy I know he's a gamer but it just seems like his wrestling is lacking I think he's slow on the feet I think he's stiff um, you know the Jordan Mean fight honestly wasn't that impressive in my opinion I felt like Mean was looking for ways out you know the entire time and, it, and the fight was still you know somewhat close so I think that Jake Matthews is honestly better than Meek in every aspect of the game but we know that Jake at times has kind of when fights get become dog fights uh, he can kind of shy away and quit he's quit at times I mean he's had his moments uh, but I still think he's better across the board than Emel Mech better striking faster stronger has more movement uh, he is backing up a lot, but he likes to sit back and counter. And I feel like this is a good fight to, for Jake to showcase all his skills like he always does, man. I feel like this, these type of fights are tailor-made for him. You know, he's got Rocco Martin, that loss. I mean, y'all have already heard me say I feel like Rocco Martin's one of the more underrated welterweights that, that's, uh, that the UFC has. So I don't knock Jake too much for that. L. I just feel like Mech is... Just a basic, slow brawler with lacking takedown defense. And I think Jake's going to uh, honestly style on him for a 30-27 decision. You know, Mech's a tough guy. I think he'll probably hang in there for the three. But, you know, I just feel like Jake will be a step out of him. Yeah, I, I can see that as well, man. I know Emil Meek's going to come in here with a lot of motivation. I mean, his back's up against the wall. He has to get this win in order to stay with the company. And like you mentioned, he came to the UFC with a lot of hype, knocked out Husimar Pagliaras with the Travis Brown elbows, uh, beat Jordan Meehan in Canada. But since that point, man, he fought the champion, Kamara Usman. And we could sit here and say, uh, you know, you went three hard rounds with him, but a lot of people go three hard rounds with him. But the thing is, I'll give him credit for this. 
Kamaru Usman is known for going out there and getting multiple 10-8 rounds against uh, you know, most of his opponents. He didn't get a single 10-8 round against Emil Meek, but he still shut him out completely on the scorecards. But then the next fight against Bartos, that's where it was like, hey, man, now's your chance to fight a poor man's Usman and show that you've learned from your mistakes and come out here and get a nice win. And he looked even worse in that fight, man. The guy's takedown defense, his get-up game is questionable to a point where – I don't even know if a year off is enough time to patch up that hole in his game, Shaq. So with Jake Matthews, he's definitely had questionable moments in the past. But kind of like I introduced this fight, man, he came into the UFC at 19 years old. He's only 25. So we've literally seen this kid grow up in front of our eyes. And uh, I kind of feel like the Andrew Holbrook days and the Bojan days are kind of behind us now. I feel like we're seeing the best version of him we've ever seen. And I simply think he's going to be a step ahead of a. Uh, Emil Meek as well. I think he's going to outstrike him on the feet. Look, there's going to be times where if Jake starts to, you know, shy away or, you know, start to cover up and back himself up into the fence, okay, then Emil Meek can definitely land some big shots. But I think that Jake Matthews is going to be timing the takedowns and just put on an overall MMA performance and go out here and win a clean decision. So I'm going Jake Matthews for the win. Now, next up in the lightweight division, we got a matchup between Jalen Turner, he's 8-5, and five, and Joshua Kulibau is 8-0. and no. Currently, they got Jalen Turner minus 210, and the comeback on Josh Kulibau is plus 175. Well, Shaq, I mean, uh, Jalen Turner's got the physical tools. He's a big boy, but, man, we know the deal. Uh, he's been knocked out more than once, more than twice, more than thrice. Not just in pros, but in amateurs as well. The guy's chin is extremely questionable, and so is his takedown defense in my eyes as well. Now with Josh Kulabau, he's kind of small for the weight class, man. The guy's a featherweight, so when you talk about the size advantage, uh, Jalen Turner is definitely going to have that in spades, no doubt about it. But I've seen this guy, Kulabau, go out here. I've seen him knock guys out with head kicks, with punches. I've seen him go the full distance. I've seen him win with ground and pounds. So, granted, the level of opposition, you know, this is going to be a step up here with Jalen Turner. But if Jalen Turner can't come out here and style on the guy, I question Jalen Turner in these tough fights, man. Um, I don't like the fact that he takes so many unnecessary hard shots to the dome it's not going to take a big knockout artist to go out here and knock him out either you know ronnie borgia is going out there knocking him out you know ronnie borgia is a guy with a five and five record man <laughs> you know what i'm saying fucking richard leroy is going out here and knocking him out so i'm not going to be surprised one bit if Joshua Kulibau comes out here and gets another knockout win over Turner, I'm actually going to go as far as picking him for a shock upset. So I'm going to pick the very undersized and small Josh Kulibau to come out here, upset Jalen Turner in his UFC debut, and potentially get a performance of the night bonus too. Jalen Turner is one of these guys, a 6'3", offensive juggernaut, but defensively irresponsible. He, he has a... Uh no respect uh, for his opponent's counter shots. He just likes to move forward in his takedown defense, like you said, for Vola. Kind of exposed that a little bit. Kula Bao, uh, from what I understand, he's a small guy for the weight class. And, you know, I think he'll have a bright future, but I feel like this is, uh, I mean, look, what happened when Jalen took a step down on Kylan Potter? You know, he put him down right away for Vola and, uh, and Vicente Luque. I just feel like are on a different level. So I think Kulaba could probably give him a tough run for his money, but I think uh, somewhere on the, along the line, Jalen will get a knockout. Now next up in the featherweight division, we got a matchup between Zubera Tukugov, he's 18-4, and four, and Kevin Aguilar is 17-2. and two. Currently, they got Kevin Aguilar minus 115, and Zubera Tukugov is minus 105. Uh, it's a pick for a reason. This is a hell of a fight, man. I'm super excited about it. Kind of contrasting styles in a way, but in that first round, it's going to be fireworks because, you know, Zubera Tukugov comes out there with that very explosive and fast left hook. Floored his last opponent. Wasn't able to get the finish, but I, I thought I personally scored that fight at least 29-27, if not 30-26 uh, for Zubera. I was kind of surprised that in Abu Dhabi of all places, they couldn't uh, give an off. You know, a win there, but props to Leron Murphy. He's he's fighting Gabriel Benitez soon. But uh, as far as Kevin Aguilar is concerned, I like this kid a lot too. Look, very tough. Tough as nails. He's a country boy. He's a farmer. I mean, the guy is so goddamn strong, and he hits like a truck too. Also, his takedown defense is great, and his get-up game is super on point. My only issue with Kevin Aguilar is he takes too many clean punches. That's... That's my big criticism of Aguilar. You know, if he didn't take all those big shots every fight, I'd actually consider him, I'd actually consider betting him in this spot because I do think that his output and his cardio 
could be the deciding factors here. It just worries me that the guy blocks so many punches, not just with his face, Shaq, but specifically with his chin. And Zubera Tukugov gets off on that left hook. He could floor Kevin Aguilar. You saw Kevin Aguilar get knocked down his last fight against Dan Ige in the first round. But that being said, I feel like Zubera Tukugov's uh, output and activity wanes as the fights go on. And it's not just his last fight against Leron Murphy. I understand he was coming off a layoff, and not only that, but it was in scorching hot weather in Abu Dhabi in an outdoor arena, so we can give him a pass for that. But Shaq, it's not just that fight. What about the Felipe Nover fight where he has such a dominant first round? Now, I thought he won all three rounds of that fight, but he, his activity definitely slowed down in the second or third. That's why it turned out to be a split decision. Thank God they got it right, though. But... Look, I think that if Zubera does not knock out Kevin Aguilar, that Aguilar is going to take over in that second and third. I think his takedown defense and get-up game is so on point, and I think he's going to grit himself to a decision win here. So I'm actually going to go with Kevin Aguilar to get it done here, man. This was an interesting fight for me, you know, when I was breaking it down, because I agree, you know, watching Aguilar's fights, I mean, one worry is the amount of, I mean, his damage meter. I mean, how when is the, uh, he's getting up there in the, I mean, I mean, he's been in a lot of wars in LFA before he got to the UFC. His fight with not only uh, the uh, Ige fight and, you know, what about that Rick Glenn fight? I mean, he got hurt in that fight as well. He was able to hurt Glenn too, but he did get hurt in that fight. Uh, the third round of the Barzola fight, he kind of, you know, do definitely uh, blocks punches with his face, and I do think that he's kind of basic and, you know, slower for 145, definitely packs a punch 100%, but man, when I was watching the table on him, I just kind of got the gist that, man, I feel like in a few years, you know, that 17 and 1, 18 and 2 record is going to be, you know, you know, 19 and 5 or something like that. I, I do feel like there's a good, there's a chance where we, we have seen the best Kevin Aguilar. Now look, he's a tough guy. And uh, I'm sure he's coming to fight now. Zuba, like you said, layoff, and I agree 100%. His first round is a, is really good, and then he kind of tends to uh, slow down, and that's because he, he has a lot of bounce in his game and mixed in with the Sambo style of wrestling. I mean, the guy exerts a lot of energy, so I agree. Man, but, you know, you kind of want someone to come after Zuba in those late rounds. You know, Leron Murphy kind of did a good job coming after that but man i kind of noticed that aguilar kind of backs up backs himself up into the fence pretty much like that's how he strikes you know is backing himself up into the fence and countering so i'm really interested to see does he make an adjustment and and uh come forward and actually move forward because i'm telling him pretty much all his fights he just backs up and and counters so uh i'm actually gonna go with zuba to google i think he i just think he's the better fighter like you said comes good in that first round but i feel like uh he'll be able to have a good read on kevin throughout the fight in comparison to a leron murphy who was kind of switching stance and it was a, a little bit more dynamic man i feel like kevin is gonna just you know throw basic combos big overhands uh things that Zub zubera can get a, a get a read on tie him up a little bit i mean his back's already in the fence so I'm, I'm gonna go with zubera by close decision i respect aguilar but i think zuba is uh the better fighter here and i and i think he'll look better in, in the second time out now, next up in the lightweight division, we got a matchup between Magomed Mustafaev, he's 14-3, and three, and Brad Riddell is 7-1. and one. Currently, they got Magomed Mustafaev, minus 135, and the comeback on Brad Riddell is plus 115. Well, Shaq, it's two credentialed strikers. Brad Riddell's got uh, the home field advantage here. Uh, who do you think is going to get it done? Yeah, Riddell had a fight of the night with uh, Jamie Malarkey, his last fight. He looked really good, and Magomed had a performance of the night. With that KO over uh, Rafael Fiziev, I mean, you're not going to see uh, too many beautiful time spins like that. I mean, that made Sports Center top 10 plays as well. Brad Riddell is a real, I mean, real deal kickboxer. I mean, that, that's fact. He beat John Wayne Parr. He, he's a, you know, he's like from City Kickboxing like Izzy and them. I mean, he he's a, he's definitely stamped in the striking side of things. Uh, Michael Matt, I would say, is a little bit more dynamic with the kicks, and Riddell, prob you know, throws primarily punches, those big body shots. Uh, I mean, this is going to be a really good fight. This has all the mankings to be fight of the night. Michael Matt Mustafayev, we know that early on, the dude is scary, he's <laughs> dynamic. I mean, it's kind of one of those things, kind of like Muslim Salikov, where you kind of don't want to get too close to him because i mean you might catch a counter and you know that might be it uh or but then it's like what happens if he gets out the first round what happens if he gets into the late rounds what happens after 
uh, all those spins are done? Does he get tired like the Kevin Lee fight? And I just don't think that Brad Riddell pro- uh, presents that level of wrestling or uh, the takedowns to initiate those grappling those grappling exchanges to to make Magomed, uh, you know, exert energy. So uh, this is an interesting fight. I do think Riddell got better as the fight progressed against Malarkey, but at the same time, he got dropped against Malarkey. I mean, you know what would happen to Magomed Mustafa if uh, Jamie Ma- <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no offense uh, to the Jamie. The stretcher would come out. <laughs> I mean, uh, I got a feeling he'd be holding his ribs, uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, praying for the ref to save him, but... Man, I do feel like Magomed Mustafaev is the more far along guy. And, you know, he said he wants to be more active. He wants to build a rhythm up in there. But I, I do think that Riddell has a path to victory in the late rounds if he can, you know, get Magomed to that point. But early on, man, I think he needs to be very careful because I'm sure he's very confident in his striking. And if he was expecting to just be in the pocket, you know, free early on with Mago Man Mustafa, he might get knocked out. So uh, I'm not sure how many knockouts he's taken in his kickboxing career. I don't think it's a lot, but Mustafa is an e- just an equally good striker. Um, it's just a matter of his cardio in the late round. So I'm going to go on Mustafa. I think he knocks Riddell out, but, you know, maybe Riddell uh, gets to him late. So we'll see. Great fight, man. It's going to be a hell of a time to watch this one. Um, I have a feeling these two are going to stand and bang until one man falls. Look, Magomed Mustafaev is definitely the more explosive guy. I'd say the better athlete, the, fa- the more you know fast twitch. But man, uh, Brad Riddell is a very experienced kickboxer, like you mentioned. And even in his MMA career, I know he was over there, you know, fighting with rash guards and you know beating up on you know these subpar opponents. But early on in his career, you know, he actually has a knockout win over Keenan Song, knocked him out with a body shot. And comes into the UFC, gets that fight of the night against Jamie Malarkey. Hell of a fight. But, man, in that third round, you know, where we're talking about, well, Magomed slows down. I mean, it was Brad Riddell that went out there and got dropped by Jamie Malarkey, who isn't exactly known for his knockout power, Shaq. And I'll tell you this right now. You know, MMA math doesn't mean shit, but... If Jamie Malarkey is out here dropping you with a left hook, I'm pretty goddamn confident, and I'm pretty sure that if Magomed Mustafa have lands similar strikes or one of his patented spins, the fight might be over shortly after Shaq. And we have seen Magomed Mustafa have go out there and knock out credentialed strikers before. You saw the Rafael Fiziev fight. Uh, Rafael Fiziev came in with a similar background as Brad Riddell. Look, Brad Riddell might be a little bit more advanced. You know, he beat John Wayne Parr, this and that. But as far as MMA is concerned... I still feel like Brad Riddell's got a long way to go, man. He's still, you know, learning the game a bit, whereas Magomed Mustafa has been pro for a very long time. He's established already. He's seasoned. So I do think that Magomed Mustafa is going to come out here and knock out Brad Riddell in the first round. If this fight gets extended, it's going to be very interesting. You know, if Magomed starts to gas out, that's where Brad Riddell has a path to victory, start to pour that volume on him, start, start to mix it up to the body once that explosion has kind of waned a little bit. But... If uh, if that explosion doesn't wane, Brad Riddell's in big trouble. I'm personally going Magomed Mustafa via first-round knockout, Shaq. Now, next up in the heavyweight division, we got a matchup between Marcos Rogerio de Lima Pezao. He's 16-6, and six, and Ben Sassoli is 7-2. and two. Currently, they got Marcos Rogerio de Lima minus 140, and the comeback on Ben Sassoli is plus 120. Well, Shaq, this is... Uh, this is Dad's Army's heavyweight. This is Dan Kelly's uh, favorite heavyweight here, Ben Sassoli. And it's interesting because he's coming off two straight no contest. You know, the final contender series, he hit the guy with a punch to the eye, but for some reason they thought it was, you know, a poke and this and that. It should have been a first-round TKO. Then the fight against uh, Greg Hardy. My boy Greg decided to take his inhaler between rounds. That's a no contest too. You think uh, Ben Sosely can come out here and get his first UFC win in somewhat home territory here in New Zealand? Ben Sosely kind of surprised everyone. Everyone thought he was going to uh, get knocked out in you know less than a minute against Greg. But, hey, he went the, the 15 minutes. But I kind of had a feeling going into that fight that it was going to possibly be uh, one of Greg's more tougher opponents. I mean, Sosely can definitely box. Uh, definitely has a good left hand, so you got to watch out for that. Uh you know, it's interesting. Pezal de Lima is one of these guys where he, I definitely consider him a, a massive stunt puller, but it's more so on the mat, you know. It's more so with the submissions. Uh, I mean, this guy, his last fight against Drew was dominating him, 10-8 first round, and, you know, next thing you know, he's tapping the mat, and that's not the first time he's done that. He's gotten off on the feet uh, several times. I mean, the dude's kickboxing is 
definitely stamped. I mean, it's legit. Uh, he's got vicious power. So I think that uh, if they stand, he's got more weapons than Sasali. He's faster. Uh, the kicks could get to Sasali as well. Uh, he's lighter than Sasali, so I think he's going to be quicker. Uh, and Sasali doesn't really wrestle. So, I mean, there's a good chance Pezal gets the, the gets the type of fight he wants. It's just very hard to trust Pezal just, uh, just in general. But... Like I said, it's usually with the submissions. And how many submissions does Sasali have? Zero. Exactly. So I'm actually going to go with Pezal de Lima in this one by a uh, unanimous decision. You know, I feel like Sasali's a very tough guy. He's got a tough chin, but I just see him being a step behind on the feet. I think the kicks are going to play a really big factor. I think that uh, he's not mobile enough to get out the way of those kicks. And you let Pezal de Lima get off on two, three uh, inside low kicks. And, you know, uh, he might have your number. So so I, I am going to lean him, but it's hard to trust Pace out of Lima. The dude's a, an all-time stump puller. <laughs> Look, uh, Ben Sassoli, he's like uh, the 2020 big country from uh, down under. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the guy's five foot nine. He's out here winging big bombs. He's got a hell of a chin. Very tough. Ground game is severely lacking, but it's lacking in a different way than Pezal de Lima. You know what I mean? Like with Ben Sassoli, it's more of a case where like you take him down, he won't get up type deal. But de Lima is the kind of lacking where if you if you put a choke on him that's not even fully locked in, he will tap that mat. And that makes me question, you know, because we haven't really seen him truly cracked inside the octagon when guys go out there and beat him they tend to take him down but i'm just wondering if ben sasoli lands one of those you know winging overhands on this guy's chin will you know will hojero de lima have a similar reaction is he down to take a knee and, and say okay i've had enough or is it just one of those things where hojero de lima you know he doesn't really train jiu-jitsu he skips jiu-jitsu class you know he only shows up to muay thai practice so I think it might be one of those situations. Look, I agree that Marcos Rogero de Lima is the better fighter, the more developed fighter, all these things, and there's a good chance he comes out here and wins this fight. He's got more tools on the feet, but I just feel like Ben Sassoli might be able to crack him here and put him down, and uh, I could be way off. I might be, but I'm going to go with my gut on this one. I'm going to pick Ben Sassoli to get the upset and knock out Marcos Rogero de Lima. Now, next up in the strawweight division we got a matchup between Yan Zonan, she's 11 and 1, and Karolina Kolvakevich is 12 and 5. Currently, they got Yan Zhao Nan minus 260. The comeback on Karolina Kolvakevich is plus 220. Well, Shaka, uh, Yan Zhao Nan finally gets a chance to crack the top 15 rankings. She's taking on the former number one contender, Karolina Kolvakevich. Uh, you think she has what it takes to to get into the rankings here and beat the biggest name of her career? Yeah, this is a great fight for Ian. You know, her last fight was against Angela Hill, who's very hyped up right now, and that was a war. I mean, she almost got triangled in that first round and was able to keep her composure and show her toughness and come back and win that fight. So, Yan Zonan, she's been tested, in my opinion, every step along the way. And I feel like this is a next logical step up with Carolina. Carolina's had a good run, you know, fought for the title, beat the former champ Rose Nama Yunus. So I think that Carolina's had a good run, but I do feel like I don't she's kinda got one foot out the door. You know, I feel like ever since the Jessica and Drodge fight, things haven't been the same. But really, things haven't been the same since the title fight. So she got submitted by Claudia Gadelia. Her only wins are against Felice Herrick by split decision and Jody Escabel in the time being. And the the real reason why I feel like this is a tailor-made fight for Jan is just the striking defense of Carolina. I mean, she leaves her chin straight up in the air. She's failed to make adjustments on that. Her last two fights, Watterson, she was the favorite. Uh, Grasso, she was the favorite. Um, and she got completely dominated in those fights by girls that, you know, at times probably, you know, back then couldn't even breathe the air. The difference here with Jan, Jan's always been able to breathe the air. She just hasn't necessarily got that uh, name recognition. Now she's finally getting it. I feel like this is a mismatch on the feet. I feel like Yan will be able to touch her anytime she wants. Her grappling's getting better. You even saw her hitting takedowns on Angela Hill as that fight progressed on. So I feel like Yan's power, speed, the the precision of her shots, the volume, the movement is just going to be too much for Carolina. And I think uh, once once she starts touching Carolina, I think there's a chance this fight gets stopped as well. I mean, I would not be surprised, but I'll say uh, Yan's on in by, you know, lopsided decision just with the volume. And there's just going to be too many clean shots landed to Carolina's face. 
Look, I know old school fans that have to battle remember when we went out there and cashed that plus 215 on Karolina Kovakevich against Rose Namajunas in ATL. Those were great times, and she went on to have the title fight against Joanna Jacek. Lost every round except the fourth where she almost knocked out Joanna Jacek. Landed a really nice punch in that fight, but then got tapped out by Claudia the very next fight and then you know, had that fight with, uh, with Jody Escabel. Then had the fight with Felice Herrig where she did a big chicken dance in that final round. And uh, since that point, man, the Jessica Andrade fight was so vicious that I feel bad for my girl Carolina. You know, it, it kind of hurts my heart to see her take those kind of shots. You know what I mean? Uh, but, man, this is the fight game, man. She came back against no disrespect to Karate Hottie or Alexa Grasso, but compared to where Andrade was ranked, those are lesser opponents, Shaq. And those are two opponents that, look, I'm not going to sit here and say she would have definitely won back in the day, but I'm going to say this. She definitely wouldn't have gotten blown out the water in both those fights back in the day. I think she would have been very competitive. And it shows that our beloved Carolina might truly be on the decline. And, you know, it's sad to see, you know, such a sweet girl, you know, not getting the results she used to. But that's the fight game for you, man. And uh, with Yan Zhao Nan, you guys know we've been high on her since that UFC debut. And we've been waiting for this sidekick knockout to finally happen. And Shaq, I think this Saturday night in Auckland, New Zealand, it is finally going to happen. I think that Yan Zhao Nan, look, whether it's a finish or not, I simply think that, look, all all the technical stuff Shaq talked about is 100% true. But what I want to talk about is I think she's much meaner than Carolina at this stage in her career. And while Carolina has kind of a Polish zombie style, she's going to move forward the whole time. All that means for Yan Zhaonan is that, hey, you're just going to have to punch this girl for 15 straight minutes or until she goes down. And I don't think Yan Zhaonan has any hesitation to do that. But I think she's going to come out here and sidekick Carolina in the face, knock her out, get a performance bonus, hit the top 15, and then we might be looking at Yan Zhaonan uh, taking some big fights uh, from here on out. So I'm going to go with Yan Zhaonan to, to get a very dominant win here over, over our favorite uh, Carolina. Co-main event of the evening in the light heavyweight division. We got a matchup between Jimmy the Brute Crew, he's 10-1, and one, and Michal Lord Oleg Zaychuk is 14-3. Currently, they got Michal Oleg Zaychuk, minus 120. The comeback on Jimmy the Brute Crew is plus 100. Man, I fucking love this fight so much. Uh, obviously, both these guys were recently undefeated prospects. They both had to take their first setbacks, and they both uh, pulled somewhat of stunts in their uh, respective losses. Now, personally, you might disagree with this, but I actually think that Michal pulled a way bigger stunt than Jimmy Crute. Let me explain what I mean. Jimmy Crute was two punches away from finishing that fight. That's what the ref said. The ref said, hey, two more punches. I'm stopped. I'm stepping in there. He got swept by a black belt, got subsequently Peruvian necktied. Very embarrassing. But with Michal, talk about being in full control. And, man, he didn't have the gas necessary in that second round. And I think it's also because... If you look at his two fights prior, he ran through these guys in a way where I think it blew up his head to a point where the guy's like, oh, all I got to do is run forward, touch these guys. They're going to start going down. But then when he, you know, moved up the division, fought, you know, a guy who's fought Johnny Bones for five straight rounds and Ovince, Ovince knows how to take that ass whooping up front and come back. Just look at that Volkan Uzdemir fight. You remember the whooping he took those first two rounds, came back, had some success in that third round. So Ovince is as experienced as as they get, and I feel like that was a big learning lesson for a guy like Michal Oleg Zaychuk, and a lot of people are saying all Jimmy Crute has to do is take this ass whooping up front, come back and finish him in the second round, and I disagree big time on that happening, and the reason why is because Look, both these guys are just kids. Jimmy Cruz 23, Michal is 24. If you think Michal is just going to come out here like he did his last fight, like he hasn't learned from his mistakes, I I just don't see that happening because he does strike me as somewhat of a smart guy. And you got to think that a 24-year-old is coming out here making adjustments and improvements and he knows that he gassed badly in that fight, so what do we got to do? We got to calm down a little bit. When you hurt the guy, don't just go, you know, and charge him forward with all these reckless shots. Take a step back, Mihal, and I think you do have the gas to go all three rounds. Now, with Jimmy the Brute Crute, I like him as well. I'm a big fan of Jim Crute. Uh, this is a guy that I felt like definitely earned his way to the UFC on his regionals. Uh, you know, I heard some show talking about how he only got a bunch of first-round finishes on the regionals. That's complete bullshit. I saw this guy go the five-round distance, more than once on the regional scene. So Jimmy Crute is very experienced on the regionals, and he's got a well-rounded game. He hits hard. You can question the merit of of his black belt, but the guy 
earned a black belt. I mean, I've seen him do some nice stuff on the ground. The thing with this fight is that Jimmy Crew kind of relies on his ability to, you know, he's the brute, man. He eats a lot of shots, and I'm not entirely convinced you can just come out here and eat Michal Oleksandr's shots. Look, I know Ovin St. Pru did that, but Ovin kind of has a style where he backs up the entire time until you start to slow down. Then he starts to charge you. Then he mixes in that double. Jimmy Crute's not going to be backing up. Jimmy Crute's going to go head-to-head with this guy. It's going to be like two bulls colliding, and I feel like in the early going, Michal's got too much firepower for Jimmy Crute. So as much as I love Jimmy the Brute Crute, I kind of feel like this might be a bad matchup for him. So I'm actually going to go with the Polish uh, Michal Oleksandr to defeat Jimmy Crute in New Zealand. I think Crute will get back on track. Surprised you? I'm surprised you went there. I thought you were going to go with uh, Jimmy there. <laughs> but uh yeah, man, I think that Jimmy Crute uh, is a guy that I don't I don't want to say he came into the UFC a little bit prematurely, but I think that it is uh competition on his local scene was a little bit overblown, you know, the, that Hex uh promotion i mean Callan comes from there i mean you know uh, <laughs> i think that jim crude uh, his fight with birchler he kind of uh basically what i'm getting at is i feel like you, you got two young guys but even though mccall's coming off the loss i feel like you got one guy that's a lot more mature than the other one you know i feel like jim crude uh his fights you know he his fight with birchler you know he's getting touched in there he's fighting openly with his hands down and you know, he's talking in there. The kid kind of lacks composure in a sense. And the Paul Craig fight, you know, at first I was giving him some credit. But when I rewatched it, man, that fight, and, you know, now he's fighting, you know, Serkinovs and, and McCall Olachechicks. I mean, that fight kind of almost is irrelevant in a sense. Um you know, Paul Craig is flopping to his back left and right. And I, I get Paul Craig, you know, he's coming off a draw against Shogun, but I'm the jury's still out on that guy to a sense. I know he beat Ankalaya, but <laughs> Let, let's revisit this conversation after the Ryan Span fight, exactly, right? Exactly. So uh, I feel like uh, McCall Olachechik, when they were both 22, was more far along. You know, uh, at that time, Crew was in there fighting Bursar. McCall was in there fighting uh, Roundtree, and you know, Clomiphene or or not, you know. Uh, and I actually looked into it. I mean. Uh, <laughs> I uh, truly, you know, because McCall's got the reputation as a uh, steroid head. I don't think he was. Uh, I mean, look, if you, if anyone knows anything about that Euro Poland scene, I mean, they're feeding kids meldonium at like, <laughs> fuck, uh, like fucking, <laughs> like in the womb. <laughs> in the womb. I mean, <laughs> I think he just came into the pool at late. So I honestly think that this whole he's on, he was on steroids for this fight, and he was on his complete horse shit. I mean, the kid's twenty four years old <laughs> like i mean and he came back and he looked good so i think that uh crude has shown signs along the way but uh that he's kind of just a little out of control a little uh he's big and he's strong but he's kind of doesn't really have much uh you know means to his fighting it just seems like he's in there trying to force everything um but he is big and he does have size on mccall and uh, when McCall did get taken down the one time, he did get finished after, but it was against the the guy with the most submissions in light heavyweight history. But the difference in their two, you know, step ups was, to be honest, Jimmy Crew got dominated against Serkinov. I mean, he came out, got taken down right away, uh, arm trapped. I mean, you know, Misha tried to quit afterwards, and then Jimmy lost position, uh, unlike a black belt would, and you know, uh, just kept going back and forth, and we got submitted with the at least McCall had some type of success at least he had a knockdown at least he dropped him hurt him several times I, I do agree I think that McCall you know after the way those two previous fights went at 20 something years old I mean you could probably assume in his head he's like oh I could do that to John Jones <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna kill OSP you know <laughs> Um, so I think that McCall Olachechik has always been more far along than Jim Crute. I think he's better than Jim Crute. You know, some people say Jim Crute's got the wrestling advantage, but when have you actually ever seen Jimmy Crute actually shoot a double and get it? I think that a lot of the times when he gets in these grappling situations, it's because uh, 
Paul Craig shot in on him and Paul Craig flopped to his back and he got on top or Misha Serkinov took him down and they just, you know, did a couple reversals and, you know, things like that. I have yet to see Jimmy Crude actually shoot a takedown and actually get it himself. So yeah, not since uh, the Hex uh, <laughs> fighting championship So days. I disagree that he's got this big wrestling advantage. I think McCall Lechekchik is going to come out here and put him down in the first round with the with that volume movement style. I think that, let, let me tell you how each guy handled their loss differently. You know, when McCall lost to Ovin St. Pru, I mean, we didn't hear from McCall for weeks. I mean, McCall <laughs> went off the face of the planet. You know, when Jim Crute lost to Misha Serganov, he, he, you know, he was drinking a beer that night and laughing about it. So uh, I think that McCall Olechechik is much more mature than Jim Crute. He fights when they're both at their best. He fights uh, more mature, and I think it's going to show on Saturday night. Main event of the evening in the lightweight division. We got a matchup between Paul the Irish Dragon Felder. He's 17-4, and four, and Dan the Hangman Hooker is 19-8. and eight. Currently, they got Dan Hooker minus 150. The comeback on Paul Felder is plus 130. Shaq, uh, it's a hell of a matchup. It's good to see these guys in the top 10 fighting for a top five spot, uh, fighting for, you know, contention in the lightweight division. Who do you think takes that step, man? Yeah, great matchup, man. So, you know, Dan Hooker, like I said, since he moved up to 155s, I mean, what's his record? Six and one, seven and one, uh, knocked out Gilbert Burns, beat the Casey, beat James Vick, uh, Ally Kinta, um, some other guys six and one jim miller so i definitely think that's the uh you know uh, definitely the right movie made talented striker jabs calf kicks the check knees up the middle it's also funny because i feel like paul felder has very similar weapons as well check knees i mean paul's got one of the best low kicks in my opinion in the mma game and his check knees are good uh, hooker's more of a jabber uh as where felder likes to throw more hooks so man this is a great matchup. Now, I don't like using MMA math, but when this fight, you know, I kind of had a feeling this fight was going to get announced, but I, I don't want to say I strongly leaned away, but, you know, it just kind of, I don't like MMA math, but they, they both these guys did fight Edson Barbosa, and, and most people think that Felder lost Edson Barbosa. Now, me and you, we bet on Felder. Uh, I mean, you know, live, I thought Paul, I thought Paul did enough to win. Um, a lot of people don't think so, but... I'm just saying one of their bodies was built for battle with Edson and one of them wasn't even close to being built for <laughs> for battle with Edson. Now, I know f things can change fight to fight and I will never, you know, use that a analogy to 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 pick a winner here, but I, I, I'm getting a sense that off Hooker's last two wins, the knockout over Vic, uh, as where Felder decision Vic, you know, is a back and forth fight and then his uh, domination over Ally Kinta. To be honest, I just feel like those fights were a little bit too easy for top 10 UFC lightweight standards. Um, you know, going into that fight, you already know how it felt about Hooker and Vic going into that fight. Uh, I mean, it was off the Felder fight, which was such a spirited war back and forth. I mean, I just personally respect Paul Felder's win over Vic a little bit more. Yeah, I just think, you know, just not... Hey, explain why. Just, you know, being closer to the situation, I just know that, you know, Vic was showing up for the... Not saying that he didn't show up for the Hooker fight, but... You know, going into the hooker fight, Vic was saying he was still held up on the Felder fight and how it didn't go. I'm, You know, that fight took everything out of him is what I'm getting at. You know, that was he's coming off the Gaethje loss. You know, uh, he's looking for his bounce back fight. I mean, that was it right there. And when he lost that, I mean, I knew it was going to go south from there. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. So I don't want to discredit. He did what he was supposed to do. He put him down in the first round. But I almost thought it was a formality. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just being closer to the situation. And then uh, his fight with Ally Akinsa. I mean... <laughs> I like Kenta. I mean, just look at what the shit he's been saying the last couple of days. I mean, the dude, uh, the dudes, uh, Khabib. I mean, look, he thinks that going five rounds with Khabib was a good thing. <laughs> like, he's getting fifty forty three <laughs> by Habib is some kind Khabib of Khabib was working prize. the jab on you, bro. <laughs> like Khabib was in there popping your head back. Habib didn't even feel like he had to take you down. <laughs> Like, bro, like, I don't get what that guy's problem is. And y'all have already heard me say plenty of times that I like Kenta has never been number four, five, six. You know, whatever. All his claim to fame is, is a couple wins over Kevin Lee and fucking... Even Kevin Lee thought the fight was a joke <laughs> in and he didn't train. You give Kevin Lee a real training camp, he beats Ally Akinta. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm not convinced Ally Akinta could beat anyone in the top 15 right now. He couldn't even I'm beat Mitch Clark. 
I mean, and that's just facts. Or Pat out in wood, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, no, I'm just joking. We're, you know, we don't mean to, for all you uh, New Yorkers out there, we don't mean to rag on We're your just having boy. fun. We you just, guys uh, like to buzz balls too. Come on now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, I just, I, I'm not saying I don't take the, the performance seriously. I mean, he looked great. He did his thing. But I can name, uh, in my opinion, 10 guys that would go out there and do the same thing. Uh, more than that. <laughs> huh? More than that. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> like. You know, I just think that the the task really, you know, wasn't that hard. I mean, I, I was getting messages from a good friend of mine. Uh, he's actually getting ready for the for the NFL Combine. He was telling me that he spoke to Ally Akinta, you know, in Chicago for UFC 238. And he was saying, bro, Ally Akinta was kind of implying that he wasn't even try, trying to fight again. <laughs> like, and this is after the Cerrone fight, after Cerrone, uh, you know, left him in that pool of blood. So, I mean, it kind of, I mean, did Al fight? I mean, that fight was over seconds in, me and, I mean. Al didn't have a chance so I think that Felder is a little bit more battle tested as of recently not saying that Hooker isn't but his fight with Vic I'm telling you you should respect that win a little bit more I, I just think that Vic uh you know answered back he hit Felder with some hard shots and before that fight the thing uh with Felder was he won't pull the trigger he you know he will never get over this top 10 hurdle or even the rankings hurdle period and he finally did that but then to turn that around against Edson Barbosa, the guy, this is like, you know, deja vu. Have you really gotten better? Have you really gotten over the hump? And, man, he, whether you think he won or lost, one thing you cannot say about Paul Felder in that fight is that he took a step back, that he, you know, got deterred for anything, that he he walked through all of Edson's hard shots, all his hard punches, and he kept moving forward, won that third round very decisively. Uh, and I thought it was a great performance, another step up for him in his career. So I think that uh, as far as this fight is concerned, I feel like that Hooker, you know, he's got the hometown edge. He's got that, you know, that going for him. But I just feel like, uh, you know, Felder's a very hard guy to knock out. He's never been knocked out, if, if I'm not mistaken, right? A uh, cut stoppage, but never, like, knocked out with punches. So Has he even been dropped before? Exactly. So, like, I just feel like Hooker has a – if he's really – you know, Hooker said he's going to put a shot on his chin, and, and that's going to be that. So, you know, uh, I'm, I just want to – I'm really interested to see if he can do that. If he can do that, man, bro, you, you know what I'm saying? That's a real fe- – uh, you know – feather in your cap if you can put Paul out I just personally I'm not going to say I don't see it happening but I just feel like Paul Felder's too dog too tough going to be bigger on fight night you know in terms of uh, thickness I think he's going to be able to take the shots I think that both these guys calves are going to be hurt afterwards uh, I feel like Paul's got slightly better calf kicks I just feel like Paul Felder's the better fighter the tougher fighter the the fighter that's more durable for this war i feel like hooker fights with his hands down uh, when he gets fatigued a little bit and paul felder has better technique throughout the throughout the fight and i feel like five rounders are really good for paul man i think that he's gonna get to dan hooker late and get a late knockout in this fight and get the biggest win of his career you know if hooker comes out here and styles on him that'll be a big uh feather in his cap but i just feel like paul felder right now is on a mission i i just feel like that Edson fight kind of just kind of you know exemplified the type of dog that this guy has man I know he's he, there's pictures of him on the internet and makeup and you know uh, <laughs> and lipstick and, and these things like that but man his last couple fights have really been impressing me I mean people were saying Vic was too tough for him and was gonna and was gonna break him or Edson was you know gonna do this and that I just feel like Dan Hooker is slightly a little bit too confident off his last two fights. Uh, and, you know, I just think Felder is going to get to him late. Yeah, you make some great points. And that Edson Barbosa fight, I just can't get that image. I'm talking about the Hooker one, man. Like, Hooker took such a whooping in that fight. And I understand Felder is a different fighter and this and that. But it just let us know that if you really, truly put it on Dan Hooker, even though he's been on this amazing streak and done all these things, the old problems you saw at Featherweight will reappear. And you put it on this guy and you're not deterred by what he brings to the table, you can beat this guy. Now, Dan Hooker brings a lot of great qualities, a lot of great skills, his jab, his left hook, his knees, his calf kicks. He's got some height, some length. Like, I can't say enough good things about a guy like Dan Hooker, the kind of performances he's been putting on. The guy's got so much confidence right now. The thing is, a lot of these guys that he's been fighting, and not to discredit 
any of his wins because they were all great wins. He's in the position he's in for a reason. But, you know, when you talk about Ross Pearson and Jim Miller and Ally Akinta, like you guys understand the deal. And then Mark DeCasey wasn't developed at all at that point. Mark DeCasey's not a top 15 fighter. Gilbert Dorino moved up to 170 for a reason. And Vic, you know, he, he went through a lot prior to that fight. You saw his two fights leading up to the hooker fight. So you guys already know the deal. <laughs> but uh, there were a lot of things going on behind the scene. But as far as Felder is concerned, my biggest issue with him back in the day. So my, my issue with Hooker back in the day was he's hittable. You know, I remember when I bet on Jason Knight to go beat him in Australia, and he did. You know, he had this tall man's defense, all these things. So when he moved up to, to 55, it got a little bit better until he went out there and fought Edson and got absolutely smashed. But with Felder, my issue with him was that he always had all the physical tools and he also always had the technique. It was just a matter of, Paul, please throw. Like, for example, this fight with Ross Pearson, this fight with Crookshank, his fight with Berkman, he is so much better than all those guys. But for whatever reason, he just didn't have the activity that we wanted and those fights were way too close for comfort. But ever since the Francisco Trinaldo loss, Look, 2017 and on Paul Felder is a completely different guy because now he's actually going out there, letting it go. And you feel like, or I feel like his confidence has been increased every single fight. Look, he goes out there with Stevie Ray. I understand Stevie Ray is slow, this and that. But look, he, he beat him in Scotland in the first round. So he's been to people's home countries before and finished them. Then the next fight with Charles Oliveira. It's one thing to knock out Charles Oliveira, but how about you get past all his submission attempts? The kid runs you through the series. Then you go out there and not just knock him out standing shack you knock him out inside the kid's guard right obviously had the very hard fight with Vic same with Barboza I just feel like Paul Felder is built for that five round war like you were saying and with Dan Hooker the only people that have put it on him lately were Edson Barboza and Jason Knight back at featherweight all these other guys he'd been fighting didn't have a chance with him when the fight started and I think Paul Felder does have a chance because Paul Felder can answer back he can take damage he is durable I'm not entirely convinced that Hooker is that durable now you can point back to the Edson fight once again he did take that ass whooping like a man a lot of people would have went down a lot earlier but you know that that fight was over you know halfway through the second round like he was just taking you know you remember dc saying we can stop this guys like we we can stop this fight right now right like like ref let's go ahead and stop it but dan hooker you know he's he's a kiwi he's so fucking tough we respect everyone you know from that part of the world you know they're true warriors but I'm not entirely convinced that he can eat these shots that Felder's going to dish out, whereas I do think, as long as Felder doesn't get hit clean on the chin, I think Felder can eat the damage that Hooker's going to dish out. So I see Felder edging out a decision here. You know, I know it could be a controversial decision, especially in New Zealand, but I think Felder does enough to win three rounds, go out there, get a 48-47, and move on. And I, and I think Hooker will be back for sure. Well, Shaq, now we got to answer some of these fan questions. Uh, firstly, shout out to all our fans. Y'all submitted a lot of questions, so we're just going to get to the best ones. Thank you guys very much. So my boy Apex says, longtime fan of Half the Battle, my guys. Much love from Indiana. Thank you very much, bro. He says, Who's your state? Yeah. He says, is the story of Ben Askren a sad one? Because he wishes it would have went differently. Um, No, because look – it's not a sad one because I mean we would have never got hashtag five seconds. I mean, I never cried when this shit happened. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And the Maya fight was a good fight. I mean, yeah. it got fight of the night, if I'm not mistaken. Um Dude, all three of Ben Askren's I mean, fights, fights were, were fucking exciting great. As fuck, <laughs> man. Like fucking Ben did his job. I, I don't think when ben, like I didn't really take him a serious threat to the title, like when he was coming over. Um I didn't think I, but I, you know, a couple good fights, you know, hey, at least he, it's not like he laid on anyone while he was in the UFC. So, yeah. I mean, Ben did his job, man. Ben did his thing, man. I hope he saved up and I wish oh, him nothing good. but the best, you know. This guy's got a couple questions, but we're just going to answer one more. So he said, this is this for you, Shaq. He said, do you see um, or did you see that Ally Kenta versus Dustin Poirier might happen at 170? Let's talk yeah. about the matchup. <laughs> I mean, what's this guy's name? Apex. Apex, bro. Dustin Poirier would, uh, oh my god, I'm not, I just don't want to, because like I feel bad for Al, because I think it's like a mixture of the, 
like you know he's saying that he doesn't think Poirier's stock is as high as he thinks. But well, what, 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 what about your stock though? Like, <laughs> like, like yeah. I can't just as delusional as his teammate Weidman. <laughs> like I, it's an ego thing, obviously. Like how could these things possibly like? Fight, that, bro! You're coming off two losses when which you devastating like, to you know what Dustin Poirier's rank is number two in the world, <laughs> like former champ, like like you have never done anything of significance, <laughs> like <laughs> you lost to Mitch Clark, like you lost on tough, you lost to Cowboy in a main event. I mean, you lost to Dan Hooker dom- in dominating fashion. I don't under what like what are you talking about? <laughs> For the record, I got Dustin Poirier via first round knockout in any weight class if those two ever fight. Nico says, "Who do you guys want to see KO Diego in his next fight?" Um, I don't think that's that hard to find. Um, you know, preferably my boy Ox Fighter. You know, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, who's coming off a of loss that needs one? Uh, Tim Means. Oh boy, I mean, uh, what Mike Perry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's do Mike Perry versus Diego. You know what I'm saying? Warrior like says, "How overrated is Adesanya?" Uh, I don't think he's overrated at all, personally. Yolo says, "Do you guys think Angela Hill is hitting her stride right now, or is she just facing the right opponents to look good against?" The latter part. Um, I think a little bit of both. The opponents are definitely favorable, but she's definitely getting more comfortable inside the octagon as well. James C says, "You guys almost always agree. How does that work?" Um, well, today we, I think we disagree on like five fights, so I think every single car is different. Hisham says, what would you line Ayakinta versus Perry at Submission Underground this weekend? Um, um, and he said, also, will five you max bet season ever return? Actually, it returned right now. Go to bestfightpicks.com. I hit up my boy Shaq. I use that promo code Shaq to get 10% off Shaq's already, package. I already uh, had a max bet not too long. Derek Lewis, my boy Black Beast. Yeah, so uh, the max bets, uh, don't, don't, back, don't, don't sleep on max bet season now. Just, yeah, just hit that promo code, my boy. Um, MMA Quick Pick says, how overrated is Loma Luke Boone me? I don't think she's overrated. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I came away somewhat impressed for five fights. But I just think she's just really young in her career, and she's kind of small yeah. for the weight class. She's only four and one, so we, let's just give her some time to develop and all that stuff. Sonny says, I think Diego did the right thing. Um, mm. He says Pereira is the fool, but he also says keep up the great work, boys. <laughs> Appreciate no, you, man. No, no comment. I mean, look. Diego, no, look, okay, yeah, get your money, but it shouldn't have been a DQ. It should have been a no contest. Like, he he knows he could have continued. The ref said, the doctor said he could have continued. But, you know, you're saying all this shit about how you're the last of a dying breed and this and that and all this shit. I'm, I'm just saying, like, just know from now on, like, I mean, well, some yeah. of us can't. I mean, it's, it sucks for anyone that had money on Pereira because Pereira was the rightful side, but it's also like Diego has zero chance of ever getting back in the mix, so let him take his 100K. It sucks. It is what it is. Sun Tzu says, do either of the hosts like Kiwi? I, I like the fruit Kiwi. I like the people uh, from New Zealand as well. Much love to Kiwi in all different types of forms, my man. Mario says, do you think Showtime will get his hand raised again? Who should yeah. he fight next? I, I like I, I like Kenta. How about how about I? I'm not convinced, motherfucker, can beat Showtime. Fucking, <laughs> I want I Kenta versus Showtime. Uh, Pettis. I mean, look, let my boy Showtime get a, at least a ranked another ranked uh, opponent. You know, yeah. I think this he got set up against Diego Ferrer. I was on Ferrer in that fight. I mean, uh, Ferrer is fucking serious, bro. <laughs> Yeah, Goldcap says, what are your thoughts on Angela Hill being the granddaughter of Barney Hill? I think it's pretty cool. I think the dude on Rogan, it came up that, like, he, like, was one of the first guys to, like, report or witness UFOs or some shit like that. Someone can correct me. I don't know the exact story, but, hey, that's cool. Uh, Dimitar says, Musasi versus Lima at 185. Who is your pick and why? I mean, you guys know where I'm from, right? I'm, I'm from Atlanta, We're Georgia. We're rolling with the ATL guy. Just like uh, Douglas Lima. There's no well, way in hell I'm Lima picking Musasi there. <laughs> Lima's going to break down this dude's legs and knock him out with a left hook. And I, and we don't have to cut weight. And I'm going to also say this. This might be a controversial hot take, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. I'm going to say Lima is actually going to be the bigger guy because well, Lima is fucking huge. Weight, bro. Now he's going to really be <laughs> like, Have you all seen that picture of Lima and Kamaru standing next to each other? Lima is massive. So. Because his weight cuts are like really Al- drastic. Alonzo says, who are the top prospects at light heavyweight, including his boy, Ankaliev? 
Ankaliyev is definitely up there. Rockage. Uh, I feel like all these guys. Uh, Oleg Sechuk. All these guys, man. Still. Crew. Uh, Walker. I mean, you know. All of them. They just had to take that first. Oh. Alonzo Menefield. Oh, yeah. Menefield. Spin. I mean, there's a lot of guys. Some guys on the up and up in that division for sure. Mario says overtime versus no time. Who wins at 205? Overtime versus no time? No time. Okay, oh, uh, Ozdemir would not Corey out in conscious. <laughs> Rob Waddell says fighters known to pull a stunt. I think he's referring to this card. So uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima pays off for sure. Maki Pitola. <laughs> Jake Matthews back in the day, but he hasn't lately. Um, I don't think he will. But, uh, Those two in particular, though. Yeah, Maki Pitola. Maki Pitola and uh, pays out de Lima. Pays out de Lima. All right. And then for the Twitter questions, Josh says... This would have been the perfect card for Nadia Kasim versus Arian Lipsky. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bummed are you that we aren't getting that fight? I'm not bummed at all. Um, <laughs> that fight would be something else, huh? Um, I yeah. got Lipsky, I think. Yeah. Uh, Matthew says, do you guys think Jimmy the Brute Crude is on the good shit? He's looking jacked. I think he hung out with Jan. <laughs> Jan uh, 2.0. Oh, okay. Jimmy or McCall? Jimmy. Why would he hang out with a... He ain't hanging out with no Jan. Jan's supporting McCall, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nah, I think Jimmy's, Jimmy's clean. always Jack, man. Jimmy's I think he's huge. clean, man. GMO says, is Carolina Kovalkovic ready to give up the UFC grind for IG thought fame? Oh, man, don't don't no, hit so on my girl don't, Carolina don't, like don't that. Don't disrespect we, her. We, like we love Carolina, bro. Uh, Kelton says, is this fight do or die for Jalen Turner? If so, how much do you factor in the has everything to lose mindset for Jalen versus the has nothing to lose mindset for Cooley Bow? I don't think it's uh, make or it's only a one loss, right? Um, two for Vola and Vicente. But he had a win in between. So yeah, yeah. So but if he goes one and three, it's not a great look, especially two L's in a row. Exciting though, man. At least you know he, someone's gonna get knocked out or he's gonna get knocked out. Um, but if he gets laid on again, like the Frivola fight, you know, then maybe not. Um, but yeah, as far as the mindset, I don't really factor in. I, I, I just think that it's one of these cases. Both guys are going to be super hungry. It's just about whose skills is going to take over on the night. Can Cooley Bow touch the chin of Jalen Turner or not? That Or can Jalen Turner touch this kid's chin? So yeah, I, I'm not really reading too much into the nothing to lose versus everything to lose type thing here. Because I mean, both these guys have everything to gain. Turner has to gain. I mean, he's still he's, so young. Yeah, he's, <laughs> He's treating cool about like a Super Bowl, you know? Exactly. Kevin Goodson says, do you think Zombie's next fight will be for the title? Korean Zombie? Yeah. No. Um, no. And he also says, do you think Fury will go the distance again with Wilder? Uh, if he's not asleep on the canvas. Oh, man. Fury's good. Uh, but, man, my boy Tay's got that one hitter. Uh no, I thought I got Tay by knockout, but Rafiri can box, man. Dave says, have you watched any video of Patolo's five-round win in 2016? What did you make of his near heart attack in the cage against Potter? Um, Look, Patolo, I think we described him pretty well in our breakdown. Yeah. Very exciting to watch, but if you're trying to trust him with your money, that's a different story completely. But as far as an exciting fan favorite, he could be that guy. Uh, Bitsphere said, do Dan and Shaq have any interesting stories involving physical altercation in the street? Nah, I mean, look, man, in this day and age, you can't really talk about that shit anymore. But, you know, maybe if we hang out in person, we'll have some yeah, fun stuff to talk about. Thing. Kings MMA says, do you think Angela Hill performs better in these short notice spots? It just depends on the opponent. She didn't perform better in the in the Yan zone and short notice spot. But, in the you know, if she's getting Hannah Cyphers and Jody Escobel, I think she will. Uh, Brandon says, what is your opinion of the current 10, po 10 point must system and... Do you think it should be, you know, half points and this and that? Look, I don't think the scoring system is the issue. I think the incompetent idiot judges are the issue. If you put anyone that knows what they're watching in there, you know, to judge with the current 10-point must system, they're going to come out with the right score. So I, I think it's the people that are judging, not the I system. I mean, look, the, la the, the card in Texas, I mean, they had judges on their phones on, on, <laughs> on IG during the fights and shit. You know what yeah, I'm saying? something <laughs> else, man. Chuck says, any takes on Wilder uh, versus Fury? Look, man, we're from the South. Uh, I'm You're cheering for Tay. I'm rooting for the guy that lives two hours away from me, and that's uh, Deontay Wilder all day, baby. Uh, I respect Tyson Fury, great boxer, all these things. And if it goes the distance, the odds definitely tend to go in his favor. But you see that face off there? Yeah, it was great. It, the, all the face offs are great. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm rooting for Wilder to go out there and knock him out. Hernandez says, in your opinion, what's the best martial arts 
for a street fight. Uh, the best thing is to avoid a street fight, man. You never know someone go to jail, bro. You know, never know someone's got a weapon or if their boys are gonna come in and jump. But uh, yeah, I do recommend training jujitsu, but not to get into a street fight just for your own personal, you know, growth or, and stuff. But uh, man, but if you want to pick jujitsu, just cause like dudes on the street aren't gonna be expecting shit like that. yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, Brett says, what are the odds that both Hooker and Felder end up in the hospital after their fight? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if good if chance. their hi- past history is any indication, uh, these two are going to be hooking, <laughs> as we like to say here in Atlanta. Very good chance. Uh, Sean says, and this is a great question. He says, in their prime, who would win between JDS? You know, back when he was knocking out War Doom and you know retiring prime, Carwin uh-huh. and uh, Fedor back when he was smashing JDS Noguera. and Fedor in their prime. Yeah, JDS. I go JDS as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of both, but I always said that JDS from that run from the Fabrizio were doing fight all the way to his first title defense against Frank Mir was the best heavyweight of all time. So I would go with JDS. Cowboy Sir Oliveira says, for you and Shaq, who is the jobber to watch at UFC uh, Auckland? Mikey Patolo. Um, Havenwood Jim says, oh, he asked me to. All right, my jobber to watch. Um, Marcos Ogerio de Lima Peza. Havenwood Jim says, is Angela Hill the female cowboy or is that just offensive to Donald? I mean, I guess it's cool that she takes after him in terms of, you know, accepting all these fights. But the big difference is Donald Cerrone has been in the top five his entire career. I don't know, one majority of those as well. <laughs> Jonathan says, what is all the hype on Mustafa? Uh, shouldn't his uh, betting line be sitting at minus 200 with all the hype? And he feels like people are counting out Riddell in this spot. Listen, okay, I know. So what was the question? He says, if the, with all this hype on Mustafa, why isn't he minus 200 right now? Oh, okay. Well, Riddell's fighting in New Zealand. You know, uh, aren't they allowed to bet legally there? Yeah, he's on, it's Riddell's on turf, and he knocked out John Wayne Parr. And he had a fight shit. of the night recently. Yeah. Um, and people might think he has the striking credentials I mean, to go some, out here some and people, beat and Mustafa. People are sketched on Mustafa, Mustafa's cardio in the late round, so. Magic Man says, are you guys willing to mortgage your house on the next opponent that Diego Sanchez fights? No, because he might win by DQ. Uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Scream says, is there a cornier person in MMA than Felder? And he, Wow, that's disrespectful. And then he said, he is irrelevant in his own city. Any cool fighter from Philly would be a massive local star with traveling rabid fans. Let me say this. If you're from Philly, my man, and Paul Felder shows up at the bar you're at, I know for a fact you're going to go up to him and ask him for a picture. So don't Can I ask you this? Who's more of a, a, a Philly? Le- well, I mean, well, we know well, Eddie Alvarez. Uh, Eddie, is. so on, who are you picking? Uh, who's the king of Philly, Eddie Alvarez or Paul Felder? <laughs> Great question. Hey, thank you so much to all our fans, all our supporters for these questions. We truly appreciate it. We love you guys very much. Now, Shaq, let's talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch? For UFC Auckland. My fight to watch is the co-main event between Makal Olechechik and Jimmy Crute. You know, two guys that looking they're looking to redeem themselves after the stunts they just pulled in their last fights. And I'm interested to see uh, who wins because whoever wins gets their name right back in it, right back in the mix and line himself right back up for another big fight. So that's my fight to watch. 100% that's the fight to watch. Uh, I'm going to pick a close second. I'm going to go with a, a striker's delight between Magomed Mustafaev and Brad Riddell. I'll be shocked if uh, someone comes out here and shoots a takedown, watch someone shoot a takedown in the first 10 seconds. But no, I feel like these two truly are going to you know, test each other's chins until one man falls. And for that reason, Brad Riddell versus Mustafaev is my fight to watch. Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC on ESPN Plus 26? My fighter to watch is going to be Yan, Yan Nine Zhao Nan. I feel like she's going to open a lot of eyes on Saturday, get her name out there to a lot of people with a signature win over a former title challenger in Carolina. And this is one of the best strikers in the strawweight division. And I'm glad that uh, a lot, now she's in that feature fight. A lot of people are going to see that sidekick to the dome. So Yan Zhao Nan is my fighter to watch. Look, my fighter to watch is Paul the Irish Dragon Felder. This is a guy that, you know, at one point people were saying he couldn't pull the trigger. He'll never hit the rankings. Now he's in the top 10. And, you know, people were saying, oh, he's just going to be a commentator. He's got one foot out the door. And his last couple of performances, that that doesn't look to me like someone with one foot out the door. It looks to me like someone who has, uh, you know, got his foot on that pedal trying to get a title shot. So I'm very intrigued to see how he handles the biggest fight of his career, the biggest stage, a five-round main event in the other man's home country, no less. Uh, For that reason, my friends, Paul Felder is my fighter to watch. 
Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this Saturday in Auckland, New Zealand. You know, uh, it's max bet season for Shaq this weekend. Uh, go to bestfivepicks.com. Use that promo code Shaq for Shaq's individual bets. Get 10% off with the promo code Shaq, maxbetseason.com, bestfightpicks.com. Also, you can follow Shaq at MMAGenius05 on Twitter or ShaqBFP on Instagram. You can follow me at Best Fight Picks. And uh, we want to thank you guys all so much. Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, all the places where we are available. Thank you guys again. And until the next time, let's cash these bets.